Hello, everyone, and welcome to McKenzie Health's Community Telephone Town Hall. We are live tonight with Althoff Station Walla, President and CEO of McKenzie Health and other McKenzie Health leaders. In addition, we are joined by thousands of residents from across Vaughan, King, and Richmond Hill listening in. To ask a question live this evening, simply press 3 on your phone's keypad. Once again, press 3 to ask a live question at any time. We're looking for questions related to the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital or COVID-19. My name is Eric and I will be moderating the town hall this evening. During this live community telephone town hall, we encourage you to get involved and to ask questions and give your opinions by voting on a few survey questions we have for you. Mackenzie Health chose this format as this is an interactive town hall with you, which means we want to hear from you this evening. Altoff and McKenzie Health's leadership team want to hear your feedback and opinions and have an open dialogue and discussion with you and other residents. With the opening of the new Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital, McKenzie Health is working closely with the provincial government and other stakeholders to help address the needs of our community during the pandemic. Tonight, our intention is to get as many questions from you as possible. You can ask a live question at any time by pressing 3 on your phone's keypad. Someone will take your name and place you in the question queue. Now, we're still having new people join us on this evening's Telephone Town Hall uh, with McKenzie Health Community Telephone Town Hall. We're live tonight with Altop Station Walla, President and CEO of McKenzie Health. In addition, we are joined by thousands of residents from across Vaughan, King, and Richmond Hill listening in. Again, we want to remind everyone joining us that you can ask a live question at any time by pressing 3 on your phone's keypad. We're looking for questions related to the Cortelucci Vaughan Hospital for COVID-19. Also, we have a few survey questions this evening. You'll have a chance to vote live on those questions as they come up. Now, this time, I'm going to introduce Mackenzie Health's president and CEO, Altoff Station Walla, so he can open up the town hall. Altoff, welcome. With the opening of the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital, Mackenzie Health is taking a leading role in helping residents impacted by COVID-19. I know there are a number of individuals joining you this evening, so Altoff, please go ahead. So thank you very much, Eric, and uh, welcome to all of our residents, and thank you for joining us this evening. We try once a year to have a telephone town hall just to find other ways to communicate and ensure you, our residents, are aware of the happenings at Mackenzie Health. Tonight, we will share uh, further information on an announcement that Premier Ford made last week at Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital. As you know, uh, when, Cordelucci, uh, hope, when Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital opens on February 7th, it will be a different opening than we initially planned. Uh, with the height of the pandemic and the second wave, we know that there's incredible pressures across the healthcare system. Uh, we know that critical care beds, ICU beds, and medicine beds are in great shortage across the province. We are moving patients regularly from the GTA to other communities to receive care. We also want to inform you about how our two hospitals will eventually work together to ensure that we can meet the needs of this uh, growing community once the surge in the pandemic has subsided. Mackenzie Health is managing through the pandemic uh, since uh, the early part of March. It's been a long haul for all of us. We've all been struggling, but we have come together as a community. So we want to provide you with de uh, greater details on how we've been managing the pandemic and how you, our community, can, can you continue to support us in, in fighting the pandemic. We'll start our conversation first a little bit uh, about Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital and then get a little bit more uh, specific around the pandemic and our efforts as it relates to vaccinations and obviously the current surge that we're facing. So Dr. Ch Chen will provide us more details on that. So before we begin our conversation, uh, we'd like you to hear from some of our government, government partners. So first, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Christine Elliott, Minister of Health and Deputy Premier to say a few words. Minister Elliott. Thank you very much, Altaf, and uh, good evening, everyone. First, I want to extend my deepest appreciation to all of you joining tonight's telephone town hall. When shovels first went into the ground for the construction of the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital back in October 2016, no one could have envisioned the unprecedented situation our province, our communities, and our healthcare system would be facing today. Yet, during this past year, a year unlike any other, Ontarians have come together to support each other and have shown the world that the Ontario spirit endures. Nowhere is this more evident than in the city of Vaughan and York Region. Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital is the first newly built hospital in Ontario in over 30 years to add net new capacity to our healthcare system 
And we are very fortunate to have this hospital coming online when our province needs it the most. So I want to acknowledge you, the leadership and staff of Mackenzie Health, the residents of Vaughan and York Region, and the many hospital donors who helped to make this hospital a reality. When Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital opens next month, it will do so with a focus on supporting the critical and acute care capacity in our overall healthcare system during these challenging times. We understand that this is a big change for the community, especially for residents in Vaughan who are expecting the hospital to fully open next month with new programs and services. And now we're asking you to wait a little longer. Our government is incredibly grateful for the role your hospital is playing in our province's pandemic response. Though your hospital may not be fully open just yet, already you are showing the people of this province the commitment and compassion they can expect from Mackenzie Health and your community. You should be very proud. And I assure you, once COVID-19 capacity pressures have stabilized, Portalucci Vaughan Hospital will fully open as originally planned to provide care and services to patients from across Western York Region. And it is my commitment that as a government, we will continue to use every tool at our disposal to support our hospitals and our communities as they respond to COVID-19. So once again, thank you for the invitation to join you this evening and for supporting our province in such an incredible way. So thank you, Minister Elliott. Thank you for your support and your ongoing efforts to help us fight this uh, very challenging time with the pandemic. Now, I'd like to invite Minister Stephen Lecce, MPP for King Vaughan and Minister of Education, to say a few words. Good evening. Thank you so much. It's uh, Stephen here. I just want to build on the message by Minister Elliott there is nothing that matters more and for myself as your member of provincial parliament in getting this hospital open and delivered for the community. It is the first new hospital in many decades providing initial capacity of over 185 beds with the York Region Stroke Center being at the new Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital with the birthing unit, the pediatrics unit, and the mental health unit, which is so timely in our discussion today on Bell Let's Talk. I just want to say uh, that this hospital represents truly the light within our region and province that we need. And paired with the vaccine rollout, I do believe more than ever that our community and our province will rise to the challenge that we will get through this and overcome the worst of COVID-19. I want to thank all the frontline workers in, the, in our hospitals um, who are making a difference in saving lives. And most especially, I want to thank you, the people of Vaughan, King, Richmond Hill, all across your region who are sacrificing, who are staying home, who are staying safe and saving lives. So thank you all for what you do. We will get this hospital open. It is our number one priority. Thank you so much. So thank you, Minister Lecce, for all your support and your kind words. Next, I'd like to introduce Minister Michael Tobolo, MPP for Vaughan Woodbridge and Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions to say a few words. Michael? Thank you, Altaf, and uh, I again want to reiterate what uh, the Deputy Premier and uh, the Minister of uh, Education said in terms of the importance of the Mackenzie Health, the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital, and what it does for not only Vaughan, but for the province of Ontario. You know, February 7th is uh, a, 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 an amazing day that will be uh, in the history books for not only Vaughan, but for the province because of the great work that's going to be starting there, uh, adding the beds that we desperately need for the fight against COVID-19. And I also want to say thank you to all the healthcare professionals that are putting their, their, their own lives on the line to help the people of the province that are, are, are fighting through this COVID-19. Um, you know, I, 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 I can't help but think of the impact that this is having not only on them, but their families. And as a minister responsible for mental health and addictions, knowing that there'll be a new unit that will be established at the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital and knowing what everyone's going through uh, as was said by, by Stephen Lecce, this is truly an important uh, and timely investment that's being made. And again, it is important that we continue. And I thank all of you on behalf of our government for staying home, for staying safe, and for saving lives. Thank you. 
So thank you, Minister Tobola, for your kind words. I'd now like to introduce our last government partner to join us this evening, uh, Mauricio Bevilacqua, the Mayor of Vaughan and Chair of the Mackenzie Health's $250 million Ultimate Campaign. Mayor Bevilacqua? Thank you, Altas, and good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me tell you how impressed that I am with the citizens that I've represented over the past 30 here, years here in, the, in York Region and in the city of Vaughan specifically. Uh, you have demonstrated really to be outstanding citizens. Uh, during this uh, global uh, pandemic, the vast, vast, vast majority of the population has really adhered to the rules and regulations and, and followed the guidelines uh, in a very impressive way. And uh, you can rest assured that we will emerge as stronger coming out of this because of the incredible capacity that you have to be such responsible uh, citizens. Uh, for us, obviously, uh, February 7th is going to be an historical moment in the history of our city. Tortolucci Vaughan Hospital uh, really intersects with history. At a time when COVID-19 is present, uh, we have an, an occasion, and we are rising to the occasion of being there for our, our provincial partners or for being there for communities, our neighboring communities as well. And this is what improving the human condition is truly all about. And at the end of the day, I believe that our purpose in life is to improve the human condition. And uh, we are doing that here in the city of Vaughan. Patience, discipline, and, pe and perseverance are essential to defeating this uh, deadly virus. And uh, in this journey, uh, we must continue to share our common purpose and pool our resources together. And this is precisely what we are doing here in the city of Vaughan. Uh, this community has been very patient, waiting for this hospital. But patience pays off because today we have a world-class hospital, the first smart technology hospital in the entire country. And um, the, really, I'd like to express to you uh, my gratitude, my gratitude for uh, the exceptional support uh, you are giving uh, this community, uh, the exceptional support uh, you are giving to everyone involved in uh, in, in COVID-19, uh, the fight against COVID-19. Uh, and while this journey may be long, uh, by, by being ready, resilient, and resourceful, and, and taking the right steps as we have, uh, there's no doubt about the fact uh, that we will come out stronger. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Bevilacqua. And I want to thank all of our government partners for taking some time this evening and sharing some words and obviously continuing to provide support to this amazing community. Thank you and have a great evening. Eric, I think we'll now go to our first question. So if I could ask you to uh, submit the question to the audience, uh, we'll get some feedback. Eric? Correct. This is our first survey question. So you can use your touchstone phone to indicate your response on this question. Do you feel that you know enough about how Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital will open in February? Press 1 if you feel that you're well informed about how Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital will support the community. Press 2 if you feel somewhat informed about how Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital will support the community. And press 3 if you're not informed at all about how Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital will support the community. Again, we want to know, do you feel that you know enough about how Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital will open in February? Press 1 if you feel that you're well informed about how Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital will support the community. Press 2 if you feel somewhat informed about how Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital will support the community. And press 3 if you're not informed at all about how Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital will help support the community. All top. So thank you very much, Eric. So as you heard from Minister Elliott, uh, the opening Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital will be not exactly as planned on February the 7th. It's different than what we had uh, spoken to you about over the many years that this hospital has been coming to life. But we know that with the second wave and the surge of cases and the pressures that hospitals are facing across the GTA, we knew that it was the right thing to do to add critical care and medicine capacity to the GTA. As I said earlier, many of our patients in the GTA are having to go as far as Kingston and London to receive care because of the pressures that we're facing. So what we want to talk to you about is a little uh, more about the details of how Corte Luchivan Hospital will open on February the 7th and eventually how we will open as part of our commitment to you as part of the two-site model with the Richmond Hill and the Vaughan Hospital working in tandem to serve this growing community. Supporting me in this uh, messaging will be Mary Agnes. She's our Executive Vice President, our Chief Operating Officer, and our Chief Nursing Executive, and our Chief of Staff. Uh, Dr. Stephen Jackson, who's also our VP Medical Planning. So maybe at this point, I'll turn it over to Mary Agnes. Thank you, Al Taff. 
Uh, and it's my pleasure to join you this evening to talk about uh, the opening of Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital. As you know, that COVID-19 cases in Ontario have been rising and we have started to see a bit of a plateau. But in terms of our hospital system, our hospitals are being stretched to our limits, especially when it comes to critical care and acute care volumes. Understanding the capacity pressures that are facing our health care system during this unprecedented time, Mackenzie Health has worked with the provincial government to provide a unique solution. When Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital opens on February the 7th, it will directly address acute care and critical surge by opening acute care and critical, critical care beds um, at the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital. We will be partnering with the Incident Management Structure um, and the System Command Centre um, to help manage volumes across the system. The Emergency Department will not open at Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital until the surge has been adequately addressed. Our focus is going to be on creating additional space to care for critical care and acute care patients and provide relief to both Mackenzie Health and the overstretched health care system. Operations at the Mackenzie Health Richmond Hill Hospital will continue as they are until the system is stabilized and we're fully able to open Corlucci Vaughan as a second hospital in a two hospital model. This means that the program transfers planned for Corlucci Vaughan Hospital, such as women and child, mental health, and the Cerbera Integrated Stroke Unit, will not proceed at this time. Opening Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital was always intended to be a tangible solution to ending hallway medicine. Now we're even more proud to play a role in supporting the healthcare system as we face unprecedented challenges caused by the pandemic. We're proud to step up and be part of the solution as we all work together to fight COVID-19. But once the surge in, in critical care and acute patients is addressed, Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital will fully open the way we planned this means that our rapidly growing community will have access to two hospitals as well as to Mackenzie Health's community-based services. Each hospital will have a full-service emergency department, critical care, surgery, and inpatient medical beds. The Corlucci Vaughan Hospital will have specialized programs, including our Women and Child Program, Integrated Stroke, and inpatient mental health care. An extensive range of outpatient clinics, the Chronic Kidney Disease Program, Complex Continuing Care and Rehabilitation will remain at the Mackenzie Richmond Hill Hospital. Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital and Mackenzie Richmond Hill Hospital will work in tandem to provide quality care through fully integrated electronic medical record, expert staff, physicians, volunteers across both sites and our community-based locations. To date, we have had more than 1,500 staff and 100 physicians recruited and 3,000 people trained between both hospitals. We have had consistently one of the busiest emergency departments in the province, and when we were experiencing unprecedented volumes prior to the pandemic, and we were over capacity for much of the time, we're looking forward to helping the system and solve the surge and opening our second hospital to serve our community. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Jackson to um, talk about our physician recruitment. Thank you, Mary Agnes. So as all of you have been waiting many years for a new great hospital, we've been planning and preparing for this fantastic new facility. And we've been in a recruitment mode for the past many, many months. And I'm really excited by the great caliber of physicians that we've been able to recruit to attract to this great opportunity where they can work in a fantastic facility. To give you just one simple example, we started to recruit for some general surgeons, and we had four positions that we could recruit for and received over 70 resumes from really highly qualified individuals. We did a thorough vetting, and it was a really difficult choice, but we're able to now recruit some fantastic individuals who are going to join our team. We're really excited by all the new people that have joined us already. We've recruited over 75 new physicians. We have new obstetricians, pediatricians, surgeons, internists, emergency doctors, and more. Now, since we've made our adjustment to how the new site is going to open in the face of this terrible pandemic and COVID-19, we have been able to find creative ways to engage all these new physicians expecting to work at the new site and have been able to help support the greater good and be able to help out with our new COVID-specific role. So we're really all ready and excited for the opportunity to begin. 
That's it, Eric. So thank you, Stephen. So Eric, maybe we'll go to our audience now and uh, get some questions from them. That sounds good. We do have some live questions that we're going to be getting to now. And I want to remind everyone that if you're joining us on the phone, you can indicate uh, that you want to ask a live question by pressing three on your phone's keypad at any time. We're looking for questions related to the Cordelucci Vaughn Hospital or COVID-19. And up first, we have Mary Lou, who's joining us live now. Mary Lou, welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you. I, uh, as I told, is it Eric, uh, that I was an old staff nurse at York Central, and I worked there for 42 years through SARS. I was interested in seeing this new hospital. I'm wondering when the COVID is, is settled down, will you be having a, an open house for people to come and tour, or is it just going to be go right back into uh from COVID on to uh, the um, regular care. So Mary Lou, we know how involved the community has been in this project and how much support we've received from them. So we will absolutely be having tours once we're able to do it safely. Obviously, uh, it'll be a time when the hospital's busy as well, but we know that the community is a cornerstone of this hospital, so we will be finding ways to share the amazing new space that we've created, the new programs that we're building, and obviously having your engagement to see uh, what we've created here. So that will absolutely happen uh, when we are safe to do so after the COVID pandemic. Mary Lou, thank you very much for that question. We have another live question. It's Degato, who's joining us live now. Degato, welcome. Please go ahead. Hi, Degato, you're joining us live on the line. Please go ahead. All right, we'll try and get Degato back in a moment to ask that question. But in the meanwhile, we do have another live question. Again, to everyone joining us, press three if you'd like to ask a live question. Bernice is joining us now. Bernice, welcome. Please go ahead. Yes, actually, you did answer my two questions that I would asked, uh, that the new hospital will only be uh, paying attention to COVID cases um, and that the... Um, McKenzie House, the operation there will be uh, looking after emergency situations. My third question, which I did not ask before, is the new hospital, does it have a helicopter pad? Um, no, no, so it does not have a helicopter pad. We're not a trauma center, so uh, that's the main reason why we don't have a helicopter pad. And when we do transfer patients uh, to the two trauma centers, St. Michael's and Sunnybrook, uh, that's done via land ambulance. That's the fastest way to get patients there. So it does not have a helicopter pad. Eric, maybe we'll go to another question from our live audience. Sounds good. Bernice, thank you for that question. We have Santos joining us now. Santos, welcome. Please go ahead. Hi, Santos. You're joining us live on the line. Please go ahead. Santos, are you there? Hello. Oh, hi. Please uh, go ahead with your question. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I, I've heard what you guys said already, but my question is, w will you be uh, able to uh, uh, take the, the COVID test as well if someone goes there or, or not? Um, so, Santos, we have two uh, COVID testing centers. We have one at the Mackenzie Richmond Hill Hospital. We also have one next to our urgent, can, urgent care center in Vaughan on Jane and Rutherford. So we will continue to provide testing in those environments. Uh, and at some point, we may also add another testing site at the Vaughan Hospital uh, if the demand is, is needed. So uh, at this point, we have two testing centers, and we obviously have the ability and the capacity to add a third if it's required by the community. Santos, thank you very much for that question. We have another live question coming up from Leah. Leah, welcome. You're joining us live. Um, hi. I think you may have hinted at this, but I may not have heard the first question when I was asking, when I was um, talking to the operator. Um, will the COVID patients from Toronto and Peel be the ones who are going to the Vaughan Hospital first, transferring? So why don't I pass this on to Mary Agnes? Uh, she can speak a little bit about the IMS structure and how patients will be transferred into the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital. Thank you, Altaf. 
Um, so since the um, beginning of the incident management structure uh, mid-November, um, in an attempt to address the issues in the GTA relative to COVID-19, um, there have been a variety of patients that have been moved throughout the system. So to date, there's been just over 600 patients that have been moved um, across the GTA um, and the central region to accommodate um, surge capacity in various hospitals that are getting into difficulty with COVID-19 patients. Mackenzie Health has been one of those hospitals. We've had over 80 patients moved from Mackenzie Health, Richmond Hill Hospital, to other hospitals nearby to be able to ensure that those patients are receiving the care they need when they need it um, at the times when Mackenzie Health um, is in surge. Bringing Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital on board as a pandemic response hospital will enable the system to continue to do that. So yes, we will have Richmond Hill, um, Mackenzie Health Richmond Hill uh, patients who will be transferred to Cordelucci Vaughan um, uh, Hospital, and we will have other patients from other hospitals when they get into difficulty um, move into the Richmond Hill Hospital. Uh, sorry, the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital. What we do have um, is agreement from the province that when the surge is no longer um, at a crisis point and we begin to uh, ramp down the activity, as we did after Wave 1, that the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital would be the first hospital to be able to move patients back out of this community to their home communities so that we can do the work of opening up the hospital in the way which, which it was intended. Thank you, Mary Agnes. Eric, maybe we'll go for some more questions from our live audience. We have another one ready to go from Robin, who's joining us now. Robin, welcome. Please go ahead. Hi there. Thank you. So I'm wondering what capacity is planned to look like for both the ICU and the medicine floors. Uh, so how many beds would be filled on a daily basis? Um, and just to confirm the bed count for both ICU and medicine. So uh, I'll let Mary Agnes respond to that. We'll give you a sense of the total bed capacity of Cordelucci Vaughan, but more particularly what we plan on opening on February the 7th. So Mary Agnes? Yeah, so the total bed capacity for Cordelucci Vaughan is about 360 beds, um, but it, and that's total for all the programs. And in terms of February the 7th, what we have been committed to opening is an additional 150 acute care medicine beds and 35 intensive care unit beds. So those are the beds that we'll be adding to the system. We will be transferring a small number of patients over from the Richmond Hill Hospital to Cordelucci Vaughan on February the 7th um, for many reasons. One, because we, we need to decant uh, some of the patients at the Richmond Hill Hospital, but also because we want to move uh, our patients here with our staff, uh, stabilize our operations, uh, and get ourselves comfortable before we start accepting patients through the incident management system. Thanks, Mary Agnes. Uh, we'll go to some more questions from our audience. We want to remind everyone joining us that if you have a live question, you can press 3 on your phone's keypad and you'll have a chance to ask a live question this evening. We are looking for questions related to the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital or COVID-19. Up next, we have Lydia joining us. Lydia, welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my question is, um, I heard a rumor that Major McKenzie Mackenzie Hospital will be closing eventually. Is there any plan for that? No, that's unfortunately a rumor. That rumor is not correct. So both hospitals will stay open. Both will have emergency departments and uh, core services to support our community. So uh, that is not accurate. Uh, obviously, with the pressures and the capacity that we uh, capacity challenges that we have in this community, we need two full service hospitals, and that's the commitment that we've had from the government from the very beginning of this project. So we will have two full service hospitals uh, with specialty focuses uh, for each of those hospitals. Lydia, thank you very much for that question. We're going to go directly to our next live question coming up from Michelle. Michelle, welcome. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, they answered my question about COVID, um, that you guys are going to have COVID uh, to get tests. But I'm just wondering, during COVID, will you guys have, like, emergency open for patients if uh, Mackenzie Health is, like, packed? Um, so at this point in time, for the pandemic response at Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital, the eMERGE department will not be open. Uh, you can continue to receive emergency care at the Mackenzie Richmond Hill Hospital, 
And once the surge subsides, then we will open Cordelucci Vaughan as intended with the Emerge Department and all the other programmatic areas like mental health, women and child, pediatrics, and uh, our integrated stroke unit. So again, uh, until we uh, deal with the pandemic surge, we will not have an Emerge Department at the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital. The space is being saved for further surge and for further capacity pressures. So that's really the rationale of why we're not opening the Emerge Department at this time. Michelle, thank you very much for that question. We're going to go to Helen, who's joining us now. Helen, welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, originally, when this uh, hospital uh, was planned, it was actually from the former Liberal government. But the former Liberal government said it was not going to be a standalone hospital. It was going to be a satellite of the McKenzie Health Richmond Hill facility, meaning that uh, there was going to be shared um, staff, shared volunteers, shared doctors, and shared nurses. Is this going to be the case? As we have seen, uh, this has devastated the nursing homes, long-term care homes, and retirement homes in our province when we share staff or nurses or volunteers or doctors. Um, it spreads diseases such as COVID, such as the next pandemic, or possibly spreading um, hospital superbugs from one facility to the other. So can you uh, tell me if this has now been fixed and we are not going to be sharing any volunteers, doctors and nurses or staffing that could spread these diseases between the two hospitals? So the staff at McKenzie Health are shared. There are obviously staff that are dedicated to each of the individual sites, but many of the staff will work across each of the sites. Our physicians will work across each of the sites. And in today's environment, many of our staff work in multiple hospitals. That's the nature of how healthcare is delivered. Uh, as you know, we screen all of our staff before they come into the hospital every single day. Um, so that's how we manage, uh, obviously, the issues of COVID-19. And we've been managing that since uh, the start of February. So, again, uh, the environment in which healthcare is delivered, staff work across multiple sites, uh, clinicians and physicians work across multiple sites, even beyond McKenzie Health. And obviously, uh, to ensure that we have an integrated two hospital model, our staff uh, will be shared between the sites, um, not all of them, but some staff will be going between the sites. Helen, thank you very much for that question. Up next, we have Christina, who's joining us now. Christina, welcome. Please go ahead with your question. Um, hello. My question is that if the Corchalucci Hospital will be relieving a possible surge of cases or emergency Im admissions in other hospitals, can the lockdowns then be lessened since there will be a lesser risk of hospitals being overwhelmed since we have Corchalucci now as sort of a backup for um, overwhelmed emergency wards? So, you know, I think we are absolutely here to help, and we believe that uh, adding Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital as a pandemic response hospital will take pressure off some of the surrounding hospitals. But as we know today, the case counts are still very high in the community. We know that it takes about two to three weeks after we see a positive case in the community to become a, a potential hospital case. Um, so until we see a dramatic drop in the community spread of this pandemic, uh, we really wouldn't imagine uh, the measures, the public health measures that are being taken to be lessened. We also have to be mindful that we now also have a variant, uh, the UK variant in particular, that spreads uh, a lot more quickly, a lot more easily. So again, the public health measures, we believe, have started to reduce the numbers, the actual case counts in, in the community. You may remember just a few weeks ago we were seeing numbers well over 4,000. Now we're seeing numbers in the low 2,000. So the work and the efforts that we are all doing in our own private lives is having an impact. We know how hard it is on our, our lives not being able to go to restaurants and, and do the things that we value so much day to day. Uh, but Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital is, is not going to uh, take those public health measures away, but it will relieve pressures off surrounding hospitals. So I think, Eric, at this point, maybe we'll go to our polling question number two, if that's all right. Yeah, that sounds good. We have another polling question uh, coming up now, but we're still having new people join us throughout the town hall. I just want to quickly welcome everyone to McKenzie Health Community Telephone Town Hall, 
We're live tonight with Altoff Station Wall, President and CEO of McKenzie Health and other McKenzie Health leaders. In addition, we are joined by thousands of residents from across Vaughan, King, and Richmond Hill listening in. We're about to do another survey question. So you can indicate your response by using your touchtone phone on the following question. We want to know, do you feel informed about what McKenzie Health is doing to support the community through the COVID-19 pandemic? Press 1 if you feel well informed about what McKenzie Health is doing to support the community through the COVID-19 pandemic. Press 2 if you feel somewhat informed about what McKenzie Health is doing to support the community through the COVID-19 pandemic. And press 3 if you're not informed at all of, around what McKenzie Health is doing to support the community through the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, we want to know, do you feel informed around what McKenzie Health is doing to support the community through the COVID-19 pandemic? Press one if you feel well informed around what McKenzie Health is doing to support the community through the COVID-19 pandemic. Press two if you feel somewhat informed around what McKenzie Health is doing to support the community through the COVID-19 pandemic. And press three if you're not informed at all about around what McKenzie Health is doing to support the community through the COVID-19 pandemic. All talk. So thank you, Eric. So I now want to switch gears and talk a little bit about the pandemic and uh, what McKenzie Health saw in the early days in February and March, and then uh, give you a perspective of what we've been doing to respond to the pandemic, all the efforts that we've made uh, to support a variety of different care settings. And then uh, turn it over to Dr. Danny Chan to give you a little bit more details around the actual virus, uh, how it spreads, but also to give you a perspective on the vaccination and how that is giving us hope to fight this and really a path forward. So we at McKenzie Health, at the McKenzie Richmond Hill Hospital, uh, saw one of the very first cases of COVID-19 uh, at the end of February and actually saw one of the first patients to be intubated uh, in an ICU in early March. Um, so clearly our staff and our organization had to adjust very, very quickly to something that was quite unknown at the time, how to manage COVID-19, how to protect uh, the environment, our staff, and how to re really ensure that we were doing the best that we could to also protect the community. Uh, the numbers of COVID-19 continued to surge um, in the months of March and April, and we plateaued in terms of our critical care bed numbers in, in early April. And at that time, we also started to see uh, the numbers decline. And obviously, they continued to decline uh, over the summer months. And then in early September, we start to then see uh, a surge in cases that started to build up, ultimately starting to peak quite dramatically in the early part of December and now into January. And that's why we're seeing some of the challenges, especially as it relates to hospital activity. Clearly, as the pandemic started in the early part of the spring and into the summer, we very quickly uh, started to create testing environments. So we opened a testing center at the McKenzie Richmond Hill Hospital. Then we opened up a second uh, assessment center for testing at our, uh, at our urgent care center or next to our urgent care center at Jane and Rutherford. We also very recently launched a vaccination clinic that we are operating out of the Corte Lucci Vaughan Hospital uh, out of our learning, our, out of our learning center at the front of the hospital. Again, we are prioritizing individuals to be vaccinated based on the provincial framework. Our target population uh, were residents in long-term care and retirement homes and staff that work in uh, retirement homes and uh, long-term care facilities. Uh, we've also been vaccinating our high priority staff, those staff that work uh, in patient facing areas that are seeing COVID patients. We continue to support long-term care centers in the community. As you know, long-term care has been particularly hit particularly hard by COVID-19 in terms of the illness, in terms of some of the mortality, morbidity that has occurred in those, in those, uh, in those sectors. So we continue to have teams going out into those facilities, supporting in infection control, supporting them in terms of staffing, and helping them manage some of the challenges that they're facing day in, day out. And we know that uh, vaccinating residents in those settings, and we know that in York Region, all residents in long-term care and retirement homes have all received their first doses. So that is a very important milestone and does protect that very vulnerable population. In the first wave and now also in the second wave, one of the challenges that we face 
was continuing to do our scheduled surgeries. As you know, uh, beds become a very precious commodity uh, in a pandemic, and uh, some of those beds and resources have to be converted, uh, especially out of the surgical uh, programs. It is very difficult for us to having, have to, having to prioritize key surgeries. In many cases, uh, many of you have been waiting months and years for your procedure. We know how difficult it is. We know how challenging it is for you to not get those procedures when you need them. So we continue to prioritize every single day. I want to reiterate, in the first wave, in the second wave, our emergency department at the McKenzie Richmond Hill Hospital is open. If you are not feeling well, if you need care, please come to the emergency department. It is safe for you to receive care. We are very worried that people are not coming to the emergency department and they are delaying their care, whether it's a cardiac event, a stroke event, and, and we are seeing situations where we're not having the best outcomes because people are waiting too late to come to the emergency department. So if you're not feeling well, please come to the emergency department. We have also had to restrict visitors, both in the first wave and again in the second wave, only to ensure that we are keeping you, our visitors, and our community safe, but also keeping our patients safe. We know that COVID uh, sometimes spread with asymptomatic individuals coming in. They feel fine, but they have the ability to spread the virus. So we want to restrict uh, visitor traffic just to ensure that we're keeping everybody safe. We also know how difficult it has been for those of you that have loved ones in the hospital and you're not able to connect with them or uh, have the updates that you would like face-to-face -face with many of our clinicians and nurses. We continue to support you through virtual methods, through a variety of different Zoom and telephone calls to ensure that you're kept up to date as it relates to the, to the progress of your loved ones. We're also providing more and more of our care in a virtual format, whether it's our virtual clinics, Again, ways to keep you out of the hospital if you don't need to be there and give you, uh, obviously, the care that you need. I also want to talk about our staff, and I want to congratulate them for everything they have done through this very, very challenging time. They have sacrificed uh, access to their loved ones. They've changed their personal lives to be able to continue to deliver the care that this community deserves. They are the brave heroes that come to work every single day despite their own fears around the pandemic, and this terrible, terrible virus. Uh, they continue to receive accolades from you, our community members. We thank you for all the things that you've done for them, whether it's the honkathons when you drive by the hospital in a, in a parade that congratulates what they're doing, whether it's your gifts and your supports. Uh, in the first wave, again, your supports for PPE when it was so scarce uh, was absolutely critical for us getting through that very challenging time. We continue to ask you to support them. Your kind words go a long, long way as they continue the battle and continue to provide care in very, very challenging times. I must say they are tired, they are exhausted, but they continue to do what needs to be done to ensure that this community receives the care that they need. So at this point, I really would like to turn it over to the expert around COVID-19, around our efforts to date, all the things that we've done to provide the care that we have, and also uh, a little bit more about the vaccination program and uh, how it will be rolled out. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Danny Chan. He's our physician lead in, in, in infection prevention and control. Dr. Chan. Thanks, Altaf. Um, first, I just wanted to start by um, giving an update on the current COVID-19 situation in Ontario. And, um, We've seen over the past week or so a leveling off and decrease, uh, a decreasing trend in the case counts, and that's an effect of the lockdown that was instituted uh, just after Christmas. Uh, that's an effect of the community's effort to decrease direct interactions between people and uh, more attention to physical distancing, uh, mask wearing, and, and hand, hand hygiene. Um, this, uh, this positive trend in decreasing cases, it will take some time before it really impacts us here in the hospitals, uh, and, and the, the rate of hospitalizations and deaths uh, uh, won't be seen for several weeks yet because of the delay between um, exposure to COVID uh, and onset of symptoms and progression to disease uh, needing medical attention. I think um, most people are aware of the news reports uh, re regarding concerns uh, about the new strains or the new variants of uh, COVID that are circulating 
in different countries around the world uh, and uh, that have now been identified in Ontario as well. Um, so variants are just uh, basically like different strains of the virus that have changed parts of their structure through mutation. This is completely expected because we've been dealing with COVID now for over a year. So these viruses have been circulating in people for over a year and viruses constantly mutate. So the fact that we have variants is expected. Um, it, it's the UK variant that has been detected so far in Ontario. The extent of spread of this variant in Ontario is not yet clear. There's more testing uh, being done led by the public health lab of, uh, uh, in, in terms of getting an idea of what the extent of, the, of this variant in Ontario is. Uh, it does look like this variant uh, spreads more easily and possibly due to a mutation that uh, allows the virus to attach to cells in a person's nose or throat more tightly. And uh, unfortunately, we do have real-world experience uh, with this uh, variant um, at uh, Roberta Place in Barrie. Uh, in that nursing home, many people got infected very quickly, uh, and that uh, and that speaks to um, the greater transmissibility of this uh, viral variant. Having said that, though, um, the way the variant virus spreads is still the same. So it spreads through respiratory droplets in close contact, especially indoors, especially in crowded spaces. And so the public health control measures are the same. So it is still uh, important um, when trying to control the spread of variants uh, to minimize uh, direct interactions between people. Uh, it remains uh, important to maintain physical distancing, masking, and, and hand hygiene. And again, we have... Uh, real-world experience saying that these control measures do work for the variants. So if you look at the UK's numbers, for example, when they instituted these uh, measures uh, in the face of, of climbing case counts with this variant, they were uh, ultimately able to decrease their case counts and, uh, and flatten their curve. I have to say, though, that one of the most important tools that we have, in addition to these public health measures, uh, is, is the COVID-19 vaccine. And in Canada, we're fortunate to have two, um, two vaccines that are approved, one manufactured by Pfizer, the other by Moderna. Uh, these uh, vaccines, um, uh, after clinical trials involving uh, 70,000 uh, patients and, and after millions of doses administered uh, worldwide so far, have had no concerning safety signals and uh, appear to be 94 to 95% effective in preventing people from getting sick with COVID. Uh, and on top of that, so far, uh, lab studies uh, have shown that both of these vaccines are uh, effective against the UK variant. Um, and studies are still going on to, to determine how effective they will be against uh, other variants that might come up. And again, we have real world data um, this time from Israel. So Israel has been uh, very efficient in rolling out its Pfizer vaccine to, the, to their population. So, uh, so far they've vaccinated over 30% of their population. Um, so far, their priority group has included um, the elderly. So most of those that, that have been vaccinated so far are over 60. And importantly, uh, about 40% of the COVID that's circulating in Israel is the UK variant. And so we have information from Israel that shows that after the first dose of their Pfizer vaccine, uh, it, it, re, it, it protects about 60% uh, of those who've received the, the first dose and over 90% of those who've received the second dose. So uh, I think that's uh, quite um, uh, reassuring and uh, uh, another reason um, to um, emphasize the importance of uh, the vaccine in ending our, our pandemic. So I'll just um, uh, end by saying that um, although our current trends in numbers look very promising, um, I would caution everyone and remind everyone that this can change very quickly uh, given, given the possibility of spread of new variants. And so I would point out the importance of not taking our eye off the ball in terms of public health measures, uh, the, the ongoing importance of, of trying to reduce direct 
person-to-person -person interaction and the importance of physical distancing and masking, and especially to use the tool that we have that has the potential to end the pandemic, and, and that is the vaccine, and to use it as quickly and efficiently as possible with the expectation that once a significant proportion of the population gets vaccinated, two-thirds or three-quarters of the population, then there will be minimal transmission. Then we can get back to something like uh, life as we remember it uh, over a year ago. Um, currently, the vaccine uh, priority groups, uh, as identified by the government, um, are, being, are, are receiving the vaccine. Um, but I'd encourage uh, everyone to learn about the vaccine now so that when it is rolled out more broadly to the community, uh, you can be confident in getting it uh, as soon as you can. So thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, I think at this point, Eric, we'll open it up to our audience uh, for some other questions. Sounds good, Altoff. We have more live questions coming up. Uh, just a reminder to everyone joining us that if you have any questions related to the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital or COVID-19, you can press three on your phone's keypad. Someone will take your name and place you in the question queue. We have Bob joining us now. Bob, welcome. Please go ahead. Okay. Before the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital opens, with staff the COVID-19 vaccination to minimize the chance of an outbreak among staff. If it was up to a vote, I would say absolutely yes. So, so thank you, Bob. So I think your question is uh, vaccination of uh, frontline staff. So maybe, Dr. Chen, I could get you to answer uh, that question around our efforts to vaccinate frontline staff. Sure, thanks. I think that's an important question. And um, the, the province has identified uh, frontline healthcare workers as a priority group uh, to receive the vaccine. And so um, at Mackenzie Health, so we have uh, certainly rolled that out and um, it is an ongoing process. Um, as many of uh, you are aware, there, there have been some supply chain issues related to um, Canada's vaccine supply. And so the rollout uh, hasn't been as smooth or as complete uh, yet for that reason. But um, yes, healthcare workers on the front line are a priority group and uh, are, getting, uh, are getting vaccinated as, uh, as the supply allows. Thanks, Dr. Chen. Eric, uh, we'll take some more questions from the audience. Sounds good. We have another live question coming up now from Stephen, who's joining us. Stephen, please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Stephen, and I, 18 months ago, I moved to the Richmond Hill area. So I came out of the, I came, I had to transfer from the South Lake uh, Services. And i uh, just like to say that uh, it's really been good, uh, our visits to the hospital, okay, uh, during the COVID. Uh, we have been we have been using the protocols uh, since last January uh, in our home, but there's two of us here who have mental health issues, and I'd like to know if there's going to be any enhancement or expansion of the mental health services at the new hospital. <laughs> well, I'll get Mary Agnes to speak about the mental health programs at both hospitals. So um, certainly, uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with health services uh, provided by the Mackenzie Richmond Hill Hospital, um, then you know that we provide full adult mental health program, both uh, inpatient uh, program, acute psychiatric uh, unit access, as well as uh, outpatient programs. When the Corlucci Vaughan Hospital um, opens, we will be able to expand our current capacity and offer more access to our community. So we will be opening um, 32 inpatient beds um, relative to our current 25. And more importantly, we will have an additional four um, psychiatric intensive care unit beds. So currently we have four. We will be opening eight at the Corlucci Vaughan Hospital. And we're really looking forward to having that increased access for our community because we know that especially the specialized psychiatric intensive care unit beds are in short demand in the system. So we're really looking forward to being able to offer enhanced services to our community. 
Thank you, Mary Agnes. I think we'll go to the next question, Eric. We have another one coming up now from Silvio. Silvio, welcome. You're joining us live. Please go ahead. Yes, good evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, my question is, are, will there all, all the rooms be a single bedroom, or will they be double or triple? Yeah, so we're very fortunate that the Coeur d'Alucci Vaughan Hospital is predominantly single bed rooms. Um, that's uh, how it was designed from a standard perspective. And the small number of uh, so-called ward rooms, that we call them three-bedded rooms that we have, they all have individual washrooms. So they're fundamentally designed almost as single bed rooms. So obviously that affords us greater flexibility from a, a flow perspective, but also uh, enables us to manage uh, infectious uh, infections a little bit differently as well with obviously that flexibility of single bed rooms. Silvio, thank you for that question. We have another live question coming from Noeller. Noeller, welcome. You're joining us live. Thank you, and thank you for having me this evening. Uh, my question is, I have uh, my cardiac file and my card cardiologist in the uh, old Richmond Hill Hospital, and now that uh, we, it's almost next to my home. Uh, will I be able to transfer my file here to the new hospital when when the hospital properly opens? And can I still have my, my same cardiologist? Thank you. I'll get uh, Dr. Stephen Jackson to answer that question. Hi, uh, that, that's a great question. We, we have probably one of the best electronic medical records that you can have in the hospital that will be available across both sites. So everybody's health record that exists at one of the two sites will be available at both sites at the same time. So all of your records will be available at either site wherever you might visit for whatever reason. And your cardiologist as well will have privilege at both sites and she'll be able to continue to have the same care that you've always had to this point with the cardiologist you currently have. Uh, there may be certain aspects of uh, clinics that may end up at one site versus the other but you'll be able to maintain the same provider, the same cardiologist that you currently have. Thanks, Dr. Jackson. I think we'll take another question from the audience, Eric. We have Eileen joining us now. Eileen, welcome. Please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Thanks for taking my question. I was scheduled to have surgery in February, and I was told by my doctor that I'm looking at about a year's wait time. Is the new hospital not going to be open for surgery? So at this point, when we open on February the 7th, we will not be open for surgery. Um, so we will continue to do surgeries out of the McKenzie Richmond Hill Hospital. Uh, once we see um, the volumes of the pandemic uh, decreasing, uh, then our intent is to open the surgical program at the Coeur d'Alene Chivon Hospital. Eric, we'll go to another question. Up next, we have Joe, who is joining us now. Joe, welcome. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, Joe. You're joining us live. Please go ahead with your question. All right. We'll try and get Joe back in just a moment. In the meanwhile, we have another live question from John, who is joining us live now. John, welcome. Hi. Thank you. And uh Thank you for the town hall tonight. It's very informative. Uh, question is the father of a recent graduate from the nursing program. Will there be hiring opportunities at the new hospital? And secondly, when would it, the public be made aware of the hospital transitioning from the uh, COVID hospital into a full service hospital? Thank you. John, I'm going to let you speak to the chief nurse uh, to answer that nursing question. Go ahead. Hi, John. So we have uh, hired over 1,500 uh, new staff already for the hospital, um, and I can tell you that we're currently continuing to hire new staff. So uh, as the father of, a, of an RPN, uh, if uh, she wants a job, ask her to apply, and uh, I'm sure she'll get an interview. Um, in terms of your second question as to when we're going to be fully opening um, Corlucci Vaughan Hospital as our, our second site. Um, at this point in time, we, we can't sit, say when that date will be um, because it really will be contingent on uh, how the surge uh, decreases, at the rate at which it comes down, and, and our ability to be able to reallocate the beds that we're making available to the system uh, and open those beds in our emergency department uh, to the community so that we can um, 
go back to our original plan. So uh, can't give you a date, um, but for sure uh, we will be informing our community as soon as we know and keeping you informed of all the changes as we go along. So thank you, Mary Agnes and John, for that great question. Uh, Eric, we'll turn it back to you for some more questions from the audience. Up next, we have Tony who's joining us now. Tony, welcome. Please go ahead with your question. Hello, and thank you for this uh, nice town hall uh, this evening. I have two questions, both related to the vaccine. Uh, first question is, if someone has tested positive for COVID, are they still eligible to receive the vaccine? And the second question is around the vaccine in children, uh, and if there's a, an age uh, where, you know, that, that they would not need it any longer because they're too young, or just a general question about the vaccine and, and children. So, Dr. Chan, can I get you to answer those two questions? Yes, of course. Uh, good questions that uh, get asked quite frequently. Um, so the first question was related to if you've had COVID before, are you still eligible for the vaccine? So I'll answer that question as uh, if you've had COVID before, should you still get the vaccine? And uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, so uh, after someone has COVID and then recovers, uh, it is likely that uh, they have some degree of immunity lasting for several months. Having said that, though, there are um, cases, uh, rare cases, of getting reinfected with COVID uh, after recovery. And it appears that uh, the vaccine, uh, the immune response that the vaccine induces is likely stronger and broader and likely more durable than what you would get uh, from um, uh, from after recovery from COVID. Uh, and on top of that, it looks like, uh, as I mentioned previously, that the immune responses induced by the, the vaccine are more likely to be effective against uh, the variants. Uh, so for those reasons, even if you've had COVID before, you should still uh, uh, get, the, get the vaccine. Um, the one caveat to that would be um, it's the province that sets the priority groups for who gets the vaccine. And so because people who recover from COVID likely have some degree of immunity for a few months, they might get placed lower on the priority list by the province. The second uh, question you asked related to children and uh, COVID vaccination. So the, the two vaccines... Um, that have been approved in Canada, so the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, uh, neither one included the pediatric uh, population in their studies. So the Moderna vaccine is only indicated for those 18 and over, and um, the Pfizer vaccine is only indicated for those 16 and older. Um, there are ongoing trials the, uh, looking at the younger age group, and uh, the Pfizer uh, vaccine has just finished enrolling uh, for their study. Um, I believe the age group goes down to 12, uh, and Moderna is still uh, enrolling patients um, of, of a younger age group uh, into their vaccine trial. Um, so at the present time, there is no um, COVID vaccine that's approved for the uh, pedi pediatric population. Having said all that, um, the other point to, re to remember is that, in general, kids who do come down with COVID tend not to have severe disease. Uh, so that is, uh, I think, a, reass a reassuring point uh, that has been uh, maintained throughout this, uh, throughout this pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Eric, we'll go to the next question from the audience. Up next, we have Dave joining us now. Uh, Dave, welcome. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, hi. Thank you for taking my question. Um, question has to do with the diagnostic imaging department. Um, I know there's been a lot of uh, money invested in, uh, in MRIs and that sort of thing for the new Cortellucci Hospital, and I'm just wondering whether that department will be uh, continuing to operate um, after February 7th, or will the entire hospital be dedicated to the, uh, uh, to the COVID uh, relief activities? Thank you. So thank you for that question. And uh, we will be opening the diagnostic imaging department uh, as we open on February 7th for outpatient testing. So that will be occurring. 
Um, so some of you may have already had book tests at the Cordell Luchivan Hospital, and uh, those tests will continue. So we're going to run uh, the MRIs, the CTs, the X-rays, the ultrasounds uh, on an outpatient basis, and obviously the inpatient support will be for the COVID patients. So uh, if you have appointments that are scheduled for diagnostic imaging, uh, they will continue uh, when we open on February the 7th. Eric, go to the next question. Dave, thank you very much for that question. Up next is Victoria, who is joining us live now. Victoria, welcome. Yes, I'd like to ask, what is the reason behind separating um, mental health inpatient services at one hospital and outpatient services at the other hospital location? I'm going to turn that over to Mary Agnes. Hi. So we have inpatient services at the Corlucci Vaughan Hospital as well as some outpatient services at, at the Corlucci Vaughan Hospital, but we will also have uh, outpatient services and out ambulatory clinics at the Richmond Hill Hospital. And that's really to provide access for both communities as well as from a, a pure space perspective being able to um, being able to to uh, provide access to care um, on both sites um, and have enough room for all of the programs that we need to uh, to need to provide um, as a, a community member, the important thing to remember is that if you need to access mental health services, you can go to either emergency department where you will be seen uh, on an emergency basis and treated, and if the determination is made that you need to be uh, in an inpatient bed, then that admission would occur at Cord Vaughan, but both communities will have full access to mental health services in the emergency department. Thank you, Mary Agnes. Uh, Eric, we'll go to the next question from the audience. Victoria, thank you again for that question. Right now, we have Linda joining us. Linda, welcome. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm just wondering, I heard earlier that you uh, have acquired some great new doctors for the Von Cordelici, and I'm just wondering what, what impact it will have if uh, we are going to lose a lot of our doctors from McKenzie Health, if they'll be going over to that hospital. So, Linda, obviously the medical staff are integrated across both hospitals, so it's one medical staff that serves both hospitals and the physicians will be working across both sites. But I'm going to get Dr. Jackson to give more details about that. Yeah, so in fact, we've increased the number of doctors that are now going to be able to serve the community. None of the doctors from Richmond Hill campus are actually going to be lost to Vaughan. We've actually added new physicians, and all physicians are going to be working across both sites looking after patients uh, that are served at both hospitals. So, in fact, no, we're not stealing from anywhere. We've actually increased the number of medical staff dramatically, and uh, most physicians will be working at both sites at different times. Thank you, Stephen. Eric, we'll take, uh, I think, one last question, and then we'll go to our, our polling question. We do have a question coming up right now from Emma. So, Emma, please go ahead with your question. Good evening. I was just wondering if we had a clear understanding, once we're vaccinated, how long uh, our immunity will last? That's a great question, and I'm going to uh, turn that over to Dr. Chan. Yes, that's a great question. Um, at this point, there isn't a definitive answer, uh, and, and that's part of what the ongoing studies and monitoring will be looking at. Um, it, in the in the test tube, it looks like it's at least uh, um, several months. And uh, as I mentioned, from uh, for someone who's recovered from COVID, it's likely in the three to six month range. So the expectation is the vaccine should exceed that. But uh, the definitive data to, to prove it isn't available yet. And part of that has to do with uh, when when the vaccines became available. So we don't we don't have. Uh, a, a very long um, follow-up time frame to be able to determine how long the vaccine is actually effective for. Thanks, Dr. Chen. So, Eric, why don't we go to our third polling question? That sounds good, and thank you again, Emma, for that question. So, using your touchtone phone, you can indicate your response on this question, and we want to know what would you like to hear in our next telephone town hall? Press 1 if you would like to hear more about new features at Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital. Press 2 if you would like to hear about improvements McKenzie Health is making at McKenzie Richmond Hill Hospital. 
Press 3 if you would like to hear more about all of the services offered by Mackenzie Health across Western York Region. Press 4 if you would like to hear all of the above. And press 5 if there's something else you would like to hear about in our next Telephone Town Hall. So again, what would you like to hear in our next Telephone Town Hall? Press 1 if you would like to hear more about new features at Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital. Press 2 if you would like to hear about improvements Mackenzie Health is making at McKenzie, uh, McKenzie Richmond Hill Hospital. Press 3 if you would like to hear more about all of the services offered by McKenzie Health across Western York Region. And press 4 if you would like to hear all of the above. And press 5 if there's something else you would like to hear about in our next town hall. Now, Altoff, I believe we're actually just about reaching the end of the town hall. With the last couple of minutes remaining, did you have some closing remarks you'd like to share with the listeners? So thank you very much, Eric. And thank, thank you uh, for inviting us in your homes for hearing about all the updates at McKenzie Health, for your great questions uh, that you provided over the evening. Uh, we will continue to keep you informed as to what is happening at McKenzie Health. Uh, there are other mechanisms by which you can continue to stay informed. Our website, social media, our community letters, our McKenzie Health Insider. We will continue to do our very best to keep you up to date on what's happening as it relates to our organization, your community hospital, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and most importantly, how we pivot back to becoming a two-site full-service uh, set of hospitals in Richmond Hill and Vaughan. So we thank you for your support. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for all that you're doing to keep our community safe, to keep yourself safe. The pandemic is absolutely a challenge. It has uh, turned our lives upside down. As Dr. Chen has pointed out, the vaccine is that glimmer of hope. We are vaccinating uh, individuals every single day more vaccines will be available very, very soon, and we know that that will absolutely change uh, our fight against COVID-19 and, more importantly, enable us to return to some semblance, semblance of a normal life, and I think that's what we are all hoping for. So, again, thank you for your support. Thank you for listening in today, and we will endeavor to do our very best to keep you informed. Have a great evening. Good night. Thank you again to everyone for joining us this evening. If you have any questions, concerns, or feedback that you would like to share with Altoff and McKenzie Health's senior leadership team, you can do so by emailing us at publicaffairs at mckenziehealth.ca. Just a reminder, you can email questions, concerns, or feedback to publicaffairs at mckenziehealth.ca. Thank you again to everyone for joining us this evening, and have a great night.